that song is taken from Revelation 19, and earlier in the book of Revelation, there's a passage in chapter 5 where he says, um, and they sang a new song, and this is the song that they sang, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, now catch this last part, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Students, I want to address some topics this morning, and a topic in particular, um, that provides for us an opportunity uh, to live out our mission. So the mission of Providence Classical School is that we are a Christian school using the classical model to train students to to impact your culture, their culture, for Christ. This morning, I want to talk about a topic that our culture at large struggles with. I want to talk about a topic, This, in fact, if we looked at this whole month, the month of February in the nation has been declared a month where we emphasize Black History Month. We have, as a nation, we have set aside that month for a purpose, and that is because for so long, the history has been not fully told. And in some many, so many ways, we have forgotten the sins of our past. While a person should be honored and recognized for whatever they accomplish, no matter what their color may be, our nation has had a problem with its abuse of African Americans in the past. And, realistically and accurately speaking, we have still have challenges even today. So I want to look at, the, at, at some passages in the scriptures, because, students, we have an amazing opportunity to impact the culture for Christ. When we look at our nation, we are still a nation that is often divided by race, by color, and even by sex. And we have the, the answer to the division that our nation, and not only our nation, but other nations, struggle with. And I want to look at that today in the book of Acts. And I want to take a snapshot of how the people of God transitioned in the book of Acts. So in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to walk through several passages, different chapters in Acts, and we'll do it fairly quickly um, for the sake of time, but get the message. In Acts chapter 1, notice what the disciples are asking Jesus. Now, put it within its context. Jesus has already been crucified. He's already been resurrected. He's appeared to the disciples. And then this is his last conversation with them before he goes up into heaven, and they're asking in verse 6, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, what is their emphasis? They've seen Jesus do the miracles. They've seen him heal. They've seen him now resurrect from the dead, and now they're seeing the one that was crucified alive, and he's been eating with them and talking with them over a period of time. And they're saying, surely this is a time that he's going to restore his kingdom. But notice the key part where they say, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? To where we as a nation are your special people again. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. So in so many ways, what Jesus is saying, look, you're focusing in on, is this the time? And you're even focusing in on, for Israel, for us as a nation. And he says, it's not for you to focus on the times. Instead, you need to know that you're going to receive power, and you're going to be my witnesses. I'm going to use you to make God known to those in Jerusalem, to those in Judea and Samaria, but also to those all over the world. Now, the disciples still didn't get that. Because when you look at the rest of the book of Acts, at the beginning of Acts, they're still thinking the issue is really for Jews. 
So the church in the early stages was almost entirely Jewish, completely made up of one ethnicity, the Jewish people. Look at uh, chapter 2. If we were to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see that as the church grew, they were unified. They had, a, they had a commonality. Notice in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. The church at, at its beginning roots was very united. They were gathered together and were in common. They were sharing, sharing one purpose, the praise and the glory of God and the exaltation of the Savior. Now, if we flip over a couple more chapters, chapter 6, verse 1, we see a problem enters into the church. Notice what happens in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples uh, was increasing... The Grecian Jews, or some of your translations may say the Hellenistic Jews, among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So here's what's going on. In the first century, in the church, as it's, be as it's grown, you have had, again, the church is primarily all Jewish at this stage, but you have two different groups within Judaism. You have those Jews that are still uh, from the land of Israel that know Hebrew, that that speak Aramaic, that, that have all of that background. And then you have these other Jews that we call them Grecian or Hellenistic Jews that have been living all throughout the other parts of the ancient world and they have adopted to the Greek culture. So their primary language is Greek. Greek was the lingua franca, the, was the language of the day. So these Grecian Jews had become accustomed to the Greek society. So now within the church, it's no longer necessarily as unified because now you have two different groups of people that are starting to be at odds a little bit. And the disciples and, and, and rose up and, and brought unity to the matter to, to address the issue. But then notice what happens in chapter 10. In chapter 10, verse 1, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. So we have to pause there for a minute. He was an officer, a centurion. That means that he oversaw 100 people in the army, in the Roman army. He's not Jewish. He's a Gentile. He's somebody that's, out, that's not Jewish. And he and all of his family were devout and God-fearing. So here's an interesting element. Although not Jewish, he was attracted to the Jewish teaching. And he had been, had been learning about the Jewish faith and practicing many parts of the Jewish faith. So when you see God-fearing in the book of Acts, that's what it's referring to. Those people that, that were not Jewish, but they were attracted to what the Jewish teachings were, were holding. So this is what this man was. And then God, through a series of events, is going to send Peter to, to Cornelius to teach him about Christ. So verse 27 in that same chapter. Talking with him, Peter went outside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with the Gentile or visit him. See what's happening? In the first century, there, were these, there was the Jewish law that said, hey, look, if you're a Jewish person and you go to eat at another person's house that's not Jewish, you become unclean. It's against our law to do that. We don't go into your house. We don't eat pork chops with you. We don't eat ham with you. We don't do those things because if we do, we'd be considered unclean. So Peter has a response. He, keep, he continues and he says uh, in verse 20, uh, um, uh, but God, verse, again in the middle of verse 28, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. So God had been in the process of showing Peter that don't call somebody unclean just because they're not Jewish. Verse 34, then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. You see what he's getting at? God's not showing favoritism based on your ethnicity. 
He's not showing favoritism based on your color. He's not showing favoritism based on your gender. God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. God is willing to accept people from all nations. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went out doing good uh, and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen, uh, not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Peter comes and says, look, I'm here at your house, Cornelius, somebody of a different ethnicity. Because I'm here to tell you that God does not show favoritism among different nations. When we look around our student body, we have multiple different ethnicities here. And we ought to praise God for that. Because the reality is, I, to my knowledge, we don't have anybody here that's within the nation of Israel. Right? So all of us, and once, according to, the, to, the, to what Peter was seeing beforehand, and the church was at the beginning, we're Gentiles. But the reality is that God does not show favoritism by a nation, by a nationality. So here is, here is the, the transition that was happening in the church, uh, that the church had started out completely Jewish, and God went through a process of teaching them that the people of God are not about one specific race. It's about believing in Christ, recognizing that Christ, the one who came, lived, died for us, resurrected, he is the judge over all. And that no matter what ethnicity, what, no matter what background, you can become a new creature in Christ. In fact, if we look at chapter 11, <clears throat> at Antioch, the gospel continues to spread. And in verse 26, so uh, Saul or Paul and Barnabas had been teaching in Antioch. And the, the church is growing, and it's growing of both Jewish people and Gentile people. And in verse 26, it says, And when we found him, we brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. It's going to be at Antioch where the church is growing and is comprised of multiple uh, backgrounds that the people are first going to be called Christians. So today, students, I want to I want to share with you a couple of the challenges that we face and the temptations that our world has fallen into. But then I want us to look at the fact and the reality that to impact this culture for Christ, we have the answer. When we look at um, what I would call identity formation. The reality is that people tend to formulate themselves within groups. People tend to flock towards groups. You have an in-group and an out-group. It's what people tend to do. And within those groupings, there are three challenges that often arise, three responses that arise. The first response is what we're gonna, I'm going to call stereotyping. The second response, ethnocentrism. And the third response, prejudice. Stereotyping is when you take categorizations of people and you, and you apply them to everybody within a group. You've had an experience with one person, and you take that and you, you, you import that idea to everybody within a whole group. So within an ethnicity, this can be made. All Jewish people are blank. All white people are blank. Uh, here, here's a, here's a non-harmful one that I grew up in, grew up with. Um, for part of my life, I grew up in a community that was probably 80, 85% African-American. 
And uh, in that section, in that, in that area, and it was cold, it got cold up there, there was always a tendency for some white people to wear shorts when it's snowing outside and you got a foot of snow. So here's the stereotype, rather harmless stereotype, but it was a stereotype nonetheless. Some of my friends would often say, why don't white people get cold? <laughs> why would they say that? Because they're seeing in the middle of the snow, people wearing shorts. And they look around and the black people weren't dressed and wearing in shorts. It was some of the white people that were wearing shorts. So that was just a, a stereotype that came out. Was it a true stereotype? No, I got cold. We get cold, but that's a stereotype that comes out. Now, that's, that's, it's, a, it's a perceived knowledge. When you think about stereotypes, it's something that you perceive to be true, although it's not true. It's a broad generalization that we put on everybody. It doesn't allow for any variability within a group. And the challenge is that when we start stereotyping, that lays the foundation for ethnocentrism and for prejudice. What's ethnocentrism? Ethnocentrism is when you perceive that perceived knowledge that you had from stereotyping, you start projecting onto your own culture thinking that your culture is superior to others. So that everybody else's culture becomes judged by the standard of your own culture. So your culture is the best culture, and the other cultures are inferior in some way. This challenge, this uh, slippery slope, is show, shows itself in a multiple ways. For example, it can become very in, in simple indifference. Because I believe that my culture is, ac is the best, then I'm just kind of indifferent towards other cultures. I'm not interested in learning about them. Uh, I've heard this stated, hey, we're in America, why don't you speak English, right? As if speaking English is culturally superior to speaking another language. It can become just simply indifferent, where we're not concerned about others of other nations because we're only concerned about those within our own culture. It can become, it can show itself in avoidance and where we focus in on cliques. The reality is that Sunday mornings is still often the most segregated time in America. Where we have black churches and white churches and Hispanic churches, we have young people churches, we have old people churches. The reality of ethnocentrism does show itself in that regard. Into, into thinking that just because we worship in this way, it's superior to the way that you worship. And there's other reasons why churches are divided on Sundays. But, but sometimes ethnocentrism just shows itself up in avoidance. I don't want to know anybody from this other culture or this other nationality. The third area that it shows itself is in using name-calling using slurs, calling people names based on their ethnicity. Certainly not a way of loving our neighbor as ourselves. To the extreme, when our ethnocentrism is expanded to hatred, that turns into prejudice. So you, you, see, the, you see the division. You go from stereotyping which can often lead to ethnocentrism, where you're thinking that your culture is better than others, uh, then to the extreme where you start hating people of other nationalities and ethnicities, and that's prejudice. And the reality is our nation still struggles in this area. Last year, you know, most of you know that my wife and I are an interracial couple. Uh, last year, we took our kids to a little restaurant over in Tomball, and the stairs that we got were amazing. I'll never go back to that restaurant again. Because people looked at us as if we were, should be killed, right? What are you doing in here type of look? That's in Tomball, right? When, when I lived in Dallas, I was invited to preach at a church. And then when the deacon, or when the pastor 
invited me. He went back to his, to his deacons and he said, guys, I want you to know in advance that, um, that, that Mr. Halloran or, or Reverend Halloran is coming, he's speaking, and he's, uh, he's interracially married. I was then disinvited to preach. Now, those are minor on my part. Walk within the shoes of some of your African-American students. My mother-in-law, uh, who's not that old, when she was growing up in Maryland, when they're walking down the street, uh, they had to step off the curb if there was a white family walking down the street and give deference to the white family. That's within our lifetime. The reality is that prejudices are still a reality in today's world. But we have the answer. We have the answer. The church is unique. Why? Why is the church of Christ unique? Because we're not formed based upon our ethnicity. We are, are the center of who we are is based upon Christ. Not upon a color. It's upon Christ the one who God loves so much that he sent for all humanity. Which is why I encourage you to get to know people of other nationalities, other races. We have the answer, and when people in our community, when we go out into the world and they see you in the college campuses, they see you engaging other people, no matter what race, no matter what that ethnicity, and loving others like Christ loved us, you make an impact. The pastor that invited me to preach was so embarrassed and ended up leaving the church because of that. Because he was so embarrassed that, that the people of God there would not, did not want me to come preach because I was interracially married. That should never be named amongst us as believers. Christ loves all. And I, my challenge to you even during this month um, is get to know some of the history in America. Some of your teachers are, are covering some areas, but continue to know about the black experience in America. Watch the movie Selma. Watch some other opportunities. Get to read some books that, that, that unpack uh, what a, a large percentage of our population had lived through and continue to live through. Watch hidden figures. Take some time and learn about other ethnicities because as we saw in Revelation, the kingdom of God, the heaven is going to be made up of people of every nationality, every language, every tongue. Students, we have the answer. The church is unique because we're not a group. We're a gathering of people that send it around Christ. So let's live that way. Amen? Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your son. And that you have given us a ministry of reconciliation where we reconcile people to one another and people to you first and foremost. So Lord, help us to go out and love others. Love our neighbors no matter what ethnicity, what background. Help us not to fall into the temptations of stereotyping and ethnocentrism and prejudice. Forgive us for the times that we have acted that way. Renew our minds. Help us to be one people united in Christ so that we can make a significant impact on the culture for Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.